Okay. So firstly, um, as far as cancer is concerned, cancer already is part of our sort of blood, what we do in the clinic generally already. We already test patients for certain mutations for bowel and breast cancer. We already test certain tumours for, for mutations to determine treatments, that, as in melanoma. So we're already used to it, but this project actually supercharges us and almost puts us on acid as far as, as genetics is concerned in cancer. We're going one step further, and actually we're going places that we don't even know yet. It's that kind of journey. So what I want to do is basically, because we're a mixed audience, I just want to go over what we're going to do as far as cancer is concerned, the type of cancers, the tumours, the samples we need. A bit about the process, because actually the devil here is in the details I'll come to, and some of the issues we'll have to come across and uh, come over, and a brief overview about where we are. And so really, we've already covered this really about who we are in cancer in the, in the GMC. We've got six main delivery partners. The women's here for, for ovaries, I'll come to. Uh, the Royal Liverpool and Broad Green, the Heart and Chest, Aintree, Chester, and our furthest outreach is the Lanx Teaching Hospital, uh, which is our furthest uh, centre uh, up towards the north end of our patch. So what are we trying to recruit to? Firstly, we have three main tumour types at the moment, and they are ovarian, predominantly here and at Lanx, lung cancer, which unfortunately Euro uh, Liverpool's the lung cancer capital of Europe, as you probably know, if you walk around the city, unfortunately, you know, the vast number of people smoking in Liverpool is amazing. Every time I walk to work in the morning, I see people after people smoking. It's, it's absolutely amazing. We, it's something we do prevention around, but that's another issue. But the, the two main lung types, uh, non-small cell and small cell, mesothelioma and neuroendocrine currently are excluded from the project. Breast uh, is in most of our centres, and there it's predominantly um, invasive cancer of the breast, no in situ disease, and that's predominantly at the Royal Aintree of Cantor, Chester and Lanx, but the, the Royal will do the, most of the heavy lifting for breast. So these are our targets. This is what we've got to get in to keep Professor Hill happy and off our backs and to ensure that we sort of are successful. So we need approximately 1,200 patients, not samples, patients that come sample the section, and they're distributed based on the propensity of these tumours. So as you can see, lung, we need 615, ovary slightly less, 73, and breast, 547. Clearly lung and breast are much more common than ovarian cancer. We're due to go live, as I'll come to in August, and the project ends in sort of late 2017. So we've got a lot of work to do. So these numbers are challenging, uh, but I'm sure we'll do it, given the colleagues and centres involved. So what do we need? Then this is really the, the, almost the engine house of the project and really where all the, some of the very, very heavy lifting we've done. And I need to, to give praise to my colleagues at Liverpool Clinical Laboratories who've done a lot of work in preparing this, going through all the SOPs, making sure all their processes are fit for practice. They've had to change some of the way they've done things. And they've done this really within a short period of time. All what we talk about today is actually done in, in what, a couple of months? Breakneck speed. It's like driving Ferrari without brakes down a mountain with lots of curves. It's been an exciting drive, but occasionally you wonder how do you keep the, the car on the road. But we've done it so far, and I'm sure we continue to do it. Now, what do LCL need to do for us? Now, firstly, we need to think about the samples into two bits. The blood sample from the patient, which is done before surgery, and essentially we have four bits of things we need to get from the blood. The DNA, for which we're going to sequence the gene, germ DNA, serum plasma, as well as RNA. These are four separate tubes processed in a specific way before surgery. And they, that's, again, all done within LCL. Now, when the patient goes to theatre, the tumour needs to be processed within about two hours or 24 hours if it's kept on ice. We need, to, we need to have a frozen sample as well as a, a sample that's been fixed in formalin and paraffin embedded. Those need to be processed in a certain way to enable a, a genomic block to be had, which then have to take a picture that goes off to NHS England. Now, the process on both the left and the right, particularly the right with the tumour samples, are very vigorous. The DNA that we extract has to be of high quality to pass quality assurance. If we fail this and, we've, and we spent hours recruiting the patient, we go back to base one, we need to recruit another patient. So this is really is one of the key steps of ensuring our success and ensuring all the time that I'll talk about in a second about recruiting the patient, it comes to fruition. And that's, again, um, down to LCL Labs, uh, who've um, put, it, put themselves in a the position to deliver this. Then just a brief post about what happens after. The, the samples come here to the women's. They go via the blood transfusion service, off to Milton Keynes, then off to Cambridge, where Illumina sequence them, and then we get a result back. And I'll come back to that closing the loop section a bit later. Now, as I said before, the devil here is really is in the detail. Um, this sounds like a nice project. Patient comes in, consent form, bit of blood, bit of tissue goes off to Milton Keynes, a bit of, you know, a bit of this and that in, in Cambridge, we get a piece of paper back, everybody lives happily ever after, and we get a pat on the back. It's slightly more complicated. It's almost like the Grand National. <laughs> you know, we're in, a, we're in a bit of a race with, with some other GMCs, and actually we're sort of one of three GMCs 
in the lead as far as cancer is concerned in getting live. Oxford and uh, Birmingham, the others. Um, so hopefully we'll pip them. But each step the patient goes through, each step the tumour sample goes through is really is a, is a steeple chase. And we don't get any prize if we fall at one of the fences. So let's just go through some of the key steps, the identification, recruitment, consent, collection, data, and reporting back, just to give you a flavour about what this will involve at the coal face, because I think then there's an appreciation, actually, the, the, what involves work, involve, the work involved by colleagues. Now, the entry criteria for the project are one of three tumours currently. Only patients with new tumours, so anybody who's had a tumour before will not be eligible, because clearly we need patients who we're, we're taking blood off them. We know the DNA's come from a, a new tumour. They have to have the sample collected at the time of surgery. And for some tumours, we're probably going to need a certain size. Because of what we need, small tumours won't do. For instance, for breast cancer, we screen for breast cancer. So we pick up now lots and lots of very, very small tumours. Probably those tumours are probably too small to take the, the material off in the lab that we can then sequence them. So we've decided with Chris Holcomb and some of my old surgical colleagues to take tumours that are two centimetres on radiology to ensure that we don't recruit patients who will have tumours that are too small to go into the project. Thankfully, we have a very good setup for identifying the patients. That's the multidisciplinary team meeting that happens every week, week in, week out, month in, month out. Cancer teams all over the northwest and in Liverpool and Merseyside meet weekly to go through all the new cases. And that will be the key area for identifying these cases. We're going to have a screen log so we can clearly see which patient's coming through. So if we suddenly have an issue about we're not getting any patients, we understand why we're not getting the patients. Every team member involved in the project will be on the delegation log, so everybody in the team knows their responsibility for delivering the project um, and knows where they fit into the story. So patient recruitment. This is then essentially in two phases. The introduction and explanation phase, which involves us introducing the project to the patient. Now, when a patient is diagnosed with cancer, it's a very delicate moment. The lady walks, I'm, I'm, I'm a breast oncologist, so I know breast the best, so to speak. The patient walks into the room, they give you a new diagnosis, you've got breast cancer. At that time of diagnosis, we then need to have a follow-on conversation about we wish to introduce you to this project called the 100 Genome Project and the opening lines to the project. Now that's sometimes a difficult uh, introduction. There's all sorts of emotions at that diagnosis of breast cancer. So it needs to be done in a delicate way and in an appropriate way. So that's one of the challenges in introducing this project to a lady or a man sometimes who may have breast cancer who, who you know, is wrought with emotions. That consent, that information is 11 pages long. So it's actually well written. With, with questions and answers, but it's, it's, a, it's a long document. So clearly we need to allow the patient some time to go and read it, digest it, and if necessary, hopefully a follow-up call with our research nurse to discuss what's in the question sheet and any questions and answers. So this will be one of the key steps, the introduction and explanation phase. Then comes the consent phase. This has to be done before surgery, given the nature of samples we're trying to collect. Then there's the issue of primary findings versus secondary findings. So the way the project's designed is that we wish to sequence the patient's uh, DNA and uh, blood for primary findings, which means findings that may be relevant to that cancer, be it breast, lung, ovarian. The secondary findings, as Lynn alluded to, is the high, high cholesterol, other findings that may be relevant to the patient's well-being or health in the long term or potentially family members. So we've got to discuss two factors, the primary findings and then these additional findings. Once they've consented, then they get a unique number and they're on the, on the path of the, of the scheme. I just want to show you what the consent form looks like, purely to, to un make you understand, actually, potentially the, the kind of thing the patient, the, the, the form the patient will be signing, the form that the, the nurse will have to go through to get that one patient onto the study, and, and why actually everything needs to be tied up to ensure success. This is 17 sections long. And as you can see, every section, the patient needs to read and initial. Now... So, so this is going to take a little time, and clearly the explanation phase and the information is going to be clear. This section is for the secondary finding. This is actually optional, uh, but clearly we're going to try and get our best to try and get as many patients onto the secondary findings as additional. But just to give you a flavour about what is involved for the patient and for the person taking the consent. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of work. So preparing for the conversation, because this is going to be key, the conversation for introducing the project, answering the questions, and then taking that consent. Now, we're, we're not in a bad place regarding preparing for the conversation because there, there are two things we're doing. Firstly, NHS England or Health Education England have got this nice training module on the website. In fact, you don't need to sit there and flip through the slides. You can print off the PDF and read through it. It's very good. I've gone through it myself, and it's very, very helpful. And anybody taking consent in the project 
will be mandatory that they've gone through this and signed that they have done it. Secondly, we're doing our own thing here as well. So in October, we're running a day for consenting as part of the project. Secondly, anybody taking part in the consent, will it be expected to have done GCP training? This is sort of the, the school certificate for tra taking uh, consent as part of clinical trials. Um, so we'll expect this as well for anybody doing the consent that they've done this training and it's actually <coughs> mandated for any clinical trial work. So anybody in the project who's doing this will have done this because we're running clinical trials left hand centre in Liverpool. So the sample collection, just briefly. So basically the blood will be done pre-op to fit in with the patient pathway. So we overlay the pathway so we're not introducing any extra visits to the patients. A special form's got to go with the bloods and they've got to be uh, processed appropriately. Uh, and to help this, we're going to be putting packs together. So actually, when the nurses come take the bloods, it makes their life easy. Uh, Similarly, with, the, with the, the tumor samples, it's going to need organization. You know, so the nurse is going to let the theaters know that this patient, who we spent maybe an hour, two hours taking the consent, very precious tumors, handled appropriately, goes into the right bucket on ice, goes off to the lab within the right time, that the lab knows that the 100 genome tumor is coming, so they're ready to process it appropriately to the high standards that we know that they'll do. And one of the key issues here is that the diagnosis and treatment of patients will not be compromised by entering the project. It will be ultimately the pathologist's decision whether there's enough tumour to enable entry. We, so uh, patient care trumps everything else. So the patient data. So this is the manual handed down to us that we need to put into a database. Now clearly the DNA and all that high uh, throughput sequencing will mean nothing if we don't have good data to back it up. So this the database we're building with Strata is actually key to ensuring the data and then how it's mined and used is, is appropriately um, functional. So, and this is what we're having to put together, the key dem demographics from the father's um, uh, surname to the mother's surname, right through to the outcome. So the level of detail within the database has got to be quite detailed. I'm not going to go through each of the sections, but essentially most things you need to know about the patient will be in the, in the data set that will be on Strata um, for, the, for our nurses to input into. So what are we going to do about reporting back the results? Because this is probably the, the, the real unknown about actually what goes back into the patient. So as Sue said, it'll take probably about six months to get the initial return uh, to us. Once we get those positive findings, we need to validate them locally. So we've got to set up a completely new system about validating for DNA findings or mutations that we may never come across. So that may need, a, need national organizations, certain GMCs may validate certain findings, so we've got to think about how we do that. We've decided that once we get validated results back, a molecular MDT of some sort will be formulated, go through the data, plan and give advice to the, the clinicians who took the consent. Again, we intend to have our own molecular MDTs here locally, but it may well be if we're dealing with a very rare mutation that you see five times every year in a very rare subset of patients, we may need to have a national MDT. We may be on the phones mm -hmm. We may defer this to a, an MDT in London. We may get results up to us from London to, to adjudicate on. So this will need both local work, local work and both national work. We may even have to go internationally with some mutations that may be so rare. So this will be learning on our feet, developing completely new ways of doing things that may transcend GMC boundaries and national boundaries. We've then got to feed that back to our clinicians and then monitor the outcomes. One of the key things is actually how does this transform the outcomes of our patients, how does this transform their healthcare and their outcomes. So a couple of things we may measure against actually, was the patient referred to a specialist service or clinic? Did they enter a screening program? Were they commenced on a primary preventive treatment? For instance, if one of G uh, Lynn's rare cancer patients, a uh, rare ch um, uh, disease patient comes back with a BRCA mutation, they may go off and have a mastectomy. So a patient, as a result of, a, of, a, of this test, who wasn't known to have a problem with a Breast, uh, a breast mutation may go for <coughs> treatment that prevents it. Were family members tested? And actually, we should think about the impact psychologically on the patient of having a positive test for a gene. They may not even been expected to. And the other thing we need to, may need to consider is the impact on the wider family. So where are we currently in cancer? So we've got three key, key hurdles yet to complete before we go live. We've got the dry run, which is basically a desktop computer exercise. I, have a, I had an email from a nice lady from NHS England who wants to come and see me. Of course, I said you can come and visit, but she'll expect to go sit down and go through all our process maps for every single tumour type, expect to know where we find the patient in the MGT right through to how the sample gets to Cambridge. She'll then report back to Professor Hill and hopefully she'll sign the certificate saying we're fit to fly. Um, we then have one final step, which, which is the dummy run. It's the full wet run where we take a tumour from a patient and run it right through 
to a blank tube going to um, Cambridge for sequencing. Once we've completed that third step, we'll be let off the leash to recruit patients, and that's going to be towards the end of August. Now, the, the IIP phase, the implementation and initiation phase, this initially is going to be three hospitals, Liverpool Women's, the Royal, and the Heart and Chest. Now, we've got quite low targets initially because this is the sort of implementation phase, the get up, get up and running phase. We're currently slated to have three tumours per site over three months, so basically one a month over three months. I think we'll get more than that, but clearly I'd rather sort of over, overperform than underperform. Um, this will be a learning experience. We, this will be the first time we're doing this in the cancer patients. Cancer patients are, are, are slightly different from rare disease patients. Remember, if you're rare disease patients, you've probably had a number of genetic tests already. The language may already be known to you. The language to some of our breast patients and, and lung patients, ovarian patients, may be completely, you might as well be t talking Chinese. So there's a, there's a, our patients will be slightly uh, sort of less, you know, N less known about or know less about genomics than maybe the rare disease patients. So this will be a learning experience for all of us, including for Genomics England, because this will be the f we'll probably be one of the first three GMCs to go live. Clearly, we need to feed back what are the issues with cancer. Are there any particular problems that need to be changed? This this all project is not set in stone. It's a very organic project, and I get that feeling already. In what's happened uh, today is that things will change. We will probably have to change things as we as we move along things will be in flux, which is a good thing. It means the product is learning. It's able to adapt and evolve during its lifetime. While we're running the IIP phase, we'll onboard the other LDPs I've talked about before, so they're ready to go in once we start three months later. And actually, while I've said we're doing three cancers initially, we are looking to onboard other tumour types to broaden um, the patients involved and lessen the burden a bit on the other tumours as well. And this is what it's going to look like, really, from start to finish. We're going to bring patients in in the MDT, go into the clinic to be recruited, they go off to surgery, have had their blood taken, goes to our GMC lab at LCL, goes off to Dermatics England, we get a positive result back, we validate molecular MDT, we management plan, and then we measure the impact. So really, this is the life cycle of the, of the product, from the MDT, we identify the patient, right through to measuring the impact on our patient. Um, a few acknowledgements. This is teamwork. I mean, you know, I, I have a rather easy job because I work with very good people, uh, both from the top, uh, Angela, right through to colleagues who are going to deliver this project, um, right through the middle. And actually, the, the, we will be successful, not because of me, because of people on this slide, and ultimately because our patients agreed to participate in this project. Um, thank you for listening. Right.